and maybe this is the difference between ISTD and some others, is I'm not just waiting for things to arise naturally. Um, you know, I am focused, I am intentional. So if I have some data which leads me to believe that this person defends against anger with depression, I'm going to test that out. Now, I might be wrong, and I might find out, no, it's pathological grief or it's something else, and I'm, I'm happy to adjust. So I, I have a great example. Hello and welcome. I'm Niall Gagan, a clinical psychologist in Berkeley, California. I'm filling in for Vincent Ryan, who usually does these interviews. I'm here today with Dr. Patricia Coughlin as part of a series of interviews we're doing with master practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. Patricia began studying ISTDP with Dr. Habib Davinlu in the late 1980s and has since become a recognized leader in the field. The three books on dynamic psychotherapy that she co-authored with Dr. David Malan are considered classics. And her newest book, Working Through in Psychotherapy, Mastering the Middle Game, will be published by Routledge Press later this year. Dr. Coughlin leads trainings and offers webinars that are open to all mental health practitioners. Patricia, I'm excited to have you with me today. It's great to see you. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So let's jump right in. Um, you know, one of the themes in this interview series is talking about experiential psychotherapy. And I think I consider and you consider ISTDP to be a form of experiential psychotherapy. But I'm curious to hear from your perspective, what would you say is experiential about ISTDP? Well, I think I'm even going to start with saying yes and no, mm -hmm. um, because uh, as, as a young colleague of mine in Denmark remarked recently, ISTDP is not primarily an emotion focused treatment. It is a psychoanalytic treatment. Mm -hmm. Habib Davilu was a psychoanalyst and he became frustrated and guilty uh, with the length and the you know, erratic outcome. And so he started to experiment with getting what we might call more experience near, right? Not so cognitive, right? Much more um, really to create a, an emotionally charged atmosphere um, in the work. And in particular to do so by dealing with the defenses and resistances that people erect against that kind of engagement, right? So he'd work on the barriers and, and pointing out to people, you know, that they were there, but not there, you know, not making eye contact, remaining very vague and passive, right? And, and so by pointing these out and the consequences of those, you know, what's gonna happen if you continue to engage this way? What are you gonna get out of it, right? I mean, just sort of challenging people around that is gonna stir up feelings. Um, but this whole topic, has been around, you know, since Freud. And people don't realize, you know, that he was a very active, challenging therapist. Most of his treatments were very brief. I mean, he had some famous, you know, four and six hour treatments. I think the longest one was with the Wolfman. It was six months long. Um, and so it really was uh, over time right, that it started to get more drawn out and more intellectual, just the therapist making interpretations and hoping that if they made just the right one, you know, that that would uh, evoke feeling. And so you had these rounds, people like Forenzi and Rock saying, you know, this has become too intellectual. It has to be more emotional and also more in the here and now, looking at what's just happening in this moment. 
Um, and then certainly Alexander and French. I mean, their classic uh, book from 1946. If you read that today, it's as fresh as could be. Um, and they talked, they were the ones who discovered the secret right, to every penetrating result was the corrective emotional experience, right? And so this also kind of dovetails with the work that Bruce Ecker is doing, who you know very well, right, that when we look at what are the actual processes, right, required uh, for deep and lasting change, especially sort of quick, dramatic, transformational change, right? It does seem like there are certain rules, right? That the brain has, um, and yet it's getting there. You know, once you get to the unconscious and the emotions and the beliefs associated with them are, then, you know, we can all help people, uh, you know, uh, look at that again. And, uh, but it's getting there, right? It's unearthing. Uh, the unconscious uh, feelings and, and anxieties that really is where skill comes in. And, and there are probably, you know, different approaches that people can use to that. Yeah, so that's a very long answer. <laughs> and a fascinating answer. Part of what I'm hearing you saying in there is that what Davin Lu was realizing and, and bringing out was something that, that you're saying Freud maybe was in touch with from the beginning and that had gotten lost in translation over it, quite a few decades after that. Exactly. I mean, it sort of happened within his lifetime, right? He started out very active. Uh, he had a pressure technique, <laughs> He go, right, I mean, so Davila wasn't the first one to talk about putting pressure on the person. But because of many things that happened in his life and as a Jew in Europe and being, you know, having to leave his home and go to London, he became increasingly pessimistic about human beings. And, and he himself started to get more passive. And in particular, the thing that he abandoned which then Davin Lu took up again, was this active approach to dealing with defense and resistances, all the smoke screens and obstacles and excuses people put in the way. So at first, again, he pressured, he was challenging, but over time he became increasingly passive. And there's a, a famous quote where he says, now we simply have to bow to the superiority of the super ego's resistance, which has all of our efforts come to nothing, right? So he sort of collapsed into helplessness. And it really was when Davin Lu started to say, look, you know, we got to do better than this and started to study and innovate that he said, oh, wait a minute. Uh, Freud was onto something, but he took a wrong turn. And I think we have to go back to a very active uh, style of dealing with defense and, and resistance. So you're right. I mean, again, there's nothing new under the sun. It's like one of the thing, one fascinating question to me is why we in the field keep forgetting and then having to rediscover, right? These essential elements. I mean, to the point where during that whole cognitive revolution, right? How people could, in our field, psychologists, psychiatrists actually doubting the existence of the unconscious. I mean, how is this even possible? You know, marketing people know there's an unconscious, right? I mean, everybody else seems to understand this. So that's a fascinating question to me. I don't know why we keep having this repetition compulsion, right? And falling into these same ditches over and over again. But yeah, it's... Uh, Particularly but, since you're, you're, you're talking about a repetition compulsion that's making people move away from the realm of what makes things move really quickly and powerful transformational results and sort of default into something that feels more laborious and exactly. clog. And you would, one would think it would be the opposite, wouldn't you? Right, but just even think about yourself or, um, you know, why is that that human beings, um, can get anxious 
and uncomfortable when things go too well. I mean, think about all the expressions. It's too good to be true. Uh, you better wait for the other shoe to fall. I mean, somebody's going to burst your bubble. Uh, you know, I mean, there are all these um, anxieties and superstitions around being powerful about being successful and effective. And so if we don't deal with that, right, we're, we're going to end up just keeping repeating these cycles. That's really interesting. Yeah. You know, as you're talking, I'm wondering, I, I could see that being a big factor. Yeah. I'm also thinking about my own work. And, and there are many sessions where I feel myself and I hear this from trainees all the time oh. saying, I just default into talking about, and I have to almost remind myself, no, don't do that. Let's go leap into the experiential space. And then every time I do, everything starts to move and everything starts to open. And yet, uh -huh. even after all these years, there's this urge to sort of deep, maybe just because we're so conditioned to be that way, or it's. I don't know what so, it is. Or dare I say, you know, we get lazy. I mean, right. you know, <laughs> who's, who's, you know, on top of their game, you know, every day. I mean, and so this is the other thing, the, this uh, ubiquitous uh, bell-shaped curve that shows up everywhere, right? So... Most of the people are in the middle. You have 20% if you're lucky on the left that are superior, right? And that are really always pushing themselves to do the best um, and are very ambitious for themselves and their patients. You have 20% who are dangerous and you should stay away from them at all costs, right? And then you have everybody else who's kind of in the middle. So, you know, you're talking about the average person, you know, they have some, a couple really great results, but a lot of it's kind of in the middle, right? They get, again, that kind of slow incremental change. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure, you know, why people are satisfied in a way, but many are with good. And, and I forget who it was. I think it was some business guy, actually, who said good is the biggest obstacle to great. So you have to be willing to give up what you do well to really get into excellence. You know, so there are lots of factors there. Yeah. And the other thing about really being good experientially is that to be really present and engaged and to be dealing with intense feelings of pain and grief and rage and guilt, I mean, that takes something, you know, on an emotional level from us, right, as therapists. And if we have our own anxieties and our own avoidance strategies, um, that's going to get in the way, you know, and we're going to collude our own defenses, intellectualizing, externalizing. I mean, I met with a man, what, a couple weeks ago in his 60s, has had two long analyses, you know, been in therapies. And yet when he talks, there was no insight into himself. Everything was externalized. Um, it was all about uh, the other women, the uh, economy, the, you know, I'm like, how can this be, right? That therapists collude not, not just in talking about what the person might be experiencing, but they talk about other people, talk about circumstances over which not, neither one of you have any control. And, and in a way, ignore the vital uh, intervening variable, right? Which is the person sitting in front of you. Yeah, so I think so that's this is one place where ISTDP 
from my understanding, really brings in, brings the person into the experiential zone and into the moment that the person wants to talk about his job and his boss and, and oh. you in that moment, rather than going along and saying, oh, and what did your boss say? Or what you are, that you in that moment say something along the lines of, huh, I'm noticing that you're talking about all these people out there and or I don't know, you tell me, what is that? What does that look Again, like? It really depends, of course, right? So if someone is simply externalizing, right? And they say, I'm so depressed, you know, well, when did that start? And what do you mean by depression? So we actually are very focused and detailed and really phenomenological. So we don't assume we understand what someone means by depressed. Right, so I would really ask, well, what do you mean? What are you actually experiencing? And when did it start? And how bad does it get? And that sort of thing, right? And then they say, yeah, it started like, yeah, two months ago, I would say. And what happened then? Um, well, you know, there was this uh, incident with my boss and, you know, he told me to do this presentation. I put blood, sweat and tears into it. And then as I was giving the presentation, I looked over and he's like making faces and like suddenly, like I could barely hold it together. I was on the verge of tears. And when it was over, I ran and I've just been depressed since, right? Okay, so there's the symptom generating situation, right? So we always, once we get the external trigger, which is almost always interpersonal, right? So if we borrow Malin's two triangles, first, I want to be somewhere on the triangle of person. I'm with my boss in the current, right? Or I'm mad at you. This happened recently because I raised my rates and some of my patients were angry with me. Okay, it's in the transference, right? Or something with the past. But you have to be somewhere specific with a person. Then I'm interested in you, how you feel, right? So I'll say, gee, how'd you feel towards your boss, right? For making those fit. Well, you know, I think it was really unfair. You know, he is such a, you know, so they're going to defend by externalizing. So I'm not going to engage in that and ask, well, why do you think he does that? Or, you know, any of that, but okay, well, that's your thought about him. That's your opinion. But well, what kind of feeling are you having there, right? Toward him, right? Because I'm going to have the hypothesis, right? So this is the other thing that's very important, right? That you have to gather data in order to form a hypothesis about what's the nature of the underlying conflict giving rise to this. And so I'm thinking, you know, this person might be internalizing their anger, right? Going to tears and depression. So that's why I'm gonna test out, well, can they get in touch with the anger toward that boss? Anybody would be angry, right? If a boss says, hey, do this, you do a great job. And he's like making faces and talk, you know, so, um, so that again, in specific situations, right, you're going to block that externalization, right, and intellectualization, right, and keep focused on tell me about the feeling, right? So we hopefully <laughs> don't engage in colluding with as if. The problem is outside of ourselves and therefore the solution is also, right? So there's nothing we can do, right? But isn't it that it's how you're dealing with your feelings about what happened and what you're making that mean? So I think that is the other thing. Experiential is a part, but not the whole. And I think that's a big mistake and a big misunderstanding that a lot of people have now, as if just feeling in and of itself is heal. I hear people say this, the more you feel, the more you'll heal. Well, is there any evidence to support that? I mean, not that I know of. I mean, just catharsis, right? 
but it's that getting to those deep anxiety provoking feelings that have been avoided seem to be a trigger right that unlocks the unconscious that brings the old memories right and then again it seems to me it's not just about dealing with those feelings but also what the person made that mean and and that can get short shrift in in some experiential work I, I remember when I was in grad school and uh, I was in my practicum, my pre-doc, I guess, practicum, there were six of us who would share an office and, and we would come back and we would ask each other, how was your session? Yeah. And whether our session was good or bad, mostly at that time was, we would assess that based on if the person cried, right? The oh. person was cried, so they got into feeling. So it was a good session, right? That was us. That was our rudimentary understanding. Oh, that's what, funny. It was all about just trying to access the emotion as an, as an end, not a means to an end, right? right. It, it was a huge thing for me when I realized the emotion is just, that opens the door to yes. the meanings, the implicit knowings about self yeah. and the world, right? Yeah. And the patterns and the responses that come from that. Right. And then, of course, you can have the other problem, right? Which is really what psychoanalysis had gotten into, which is just the cognitive insight, really, right? So the person say, yeah, I know I do this and it's related to my mother. And, you know, I'll say, yeah, okay, well, that and a couple bucks gets you right on the subway. I mean, you know, just having an intellectual insight. It's like, so again, it's we need to get heart and head going. And I, I have a great example of this recently. And it just drove it home to me, you know? So uh, I'm working with this woman who long, long history, anxiety, depression, and lots of catastrophizing and, uh, you know, always uh, sort of hypochondriacal, you know, worried about all kinds of uh, things that are gonna go wrong. And uh, so we were looking at a recent example and, it turns out we, we had identified this trigger that when she makes a bid for connection with someone you know, who's close to her, who she wants contact with, and they don't respond in the way she wants them to, right? She'll go to anxiety and depression, right? So I'm thinking, okay, the missing piece here is, is her anger at them, right? So I'm spending the time you know, dealing with her defenses, trying to help her get to the anger. And, you know, time is kind of running out uh, on the hour. But, uh, but we, she gets to these feelings of, of anger about not being responded to in the current. And then suddenly, so that opened the unconscious. And then she said, oh my God. Suddenly I see myself, I'm 11 months old, I'm in a crib, her, she was one of a big, you know, Irish Catholic brood, her mother had been hospitalized, and the father couldn't take care of all these kids, they put her in an orphanage for a month or two until the mother could come back. So suddenly she literally has this image and feels like she says, that's what happens every time. I'm, I'm a helpless infant in a crib and nobody's coming, you know, to, to responding. And so like time is up. So I make a comment, which to me was like a total throwaway. I mean, I, nothing to, I just said, but you're not. Okay, that's all I said. And then see you next week. Okay. So I was just knocked over when I see, you know, we get on the next week and she this is she immediately begins with, but you're not. But you're not. Those three words, if I haven't thought of that countless times this week, I'm not. I, I'm, you know, a confident 60 year old woman. I mean, so again, it just reinforced to me. It's like, okay, feelings were the, the entry, as you say, opens up the unconscious, 
we get the link and now her, you know, 60 year old brain can look at it again and see, but I'm not. And, and I have other avenues. I'm not a helpless infant, you know, so, and that was huge. And I think just getting the emotion and even the link without, you know, again, this is the juxtaposition or the corrective experience. We have different labels for that, but that it seems to me is, is really what locks the, the change into place. And, and it seems like that whole image that she had and the, the vivid, visceral memory of being yes. that age and being that helpless, just it didn't come from the top down. That wasn't an intellectual. It wasn't that you interpreted and said, maybe this reminds At you all. of your time in the earth. You I didn't, didn't even know. Oh, right, right, <laughs> right. right. But yeah. it came, you, you brought her into a space that was here and now, and that arose from the bottom up in a very surprising to her and powerful way. Exactly. It does seem like in that space, you just happened to come along with something that disconfirmed that. Right. That was a, that was a, right. sounds Again, like it was a, right? Yeah, but the trick or the skill, right, is in getting to those. To getting the, to those places in the first place. Right. Right, because I really uh, not just have had the experience myself over all these years, but certainly there's a lot of research that we like to think of ourselves as, you know, rational people and that, you know, most of our decisions and behavior is based on our conscious. Uh, and there's no, again, no evidence to support that. I mean, so really, we're running on unconscious emotional programs and so we if you know we need to bring those to light in order to reconsider them and and change them when people are stuck so in its focus on the defenses does istdp still use interpretation to some extent or or is interpretation largely avoided because you want to really just see what comes up freshly and immediately as you confront the different defenses what's, no, what's i mean it's, it's a great Question. I mean, if you read Davilo, um, of course he used interpretation as well, right? This is a multimodal treatment. And again, I think it's really being very reductionistic to think of it as just about that big emotional breakthrough. I think that's one of six uh, key factors, all of which separately have research support. That's really what I was doing in maximizing effectiveness. I was breaking down the method. He calls it the central dynamic sequence, six steps, and each one is supported by research. So again, I have some good examples of this. So what is an interpretation? Right. So again, we tend to use those two triangles as kind of a a way to organize all the material and kind of know where we are and have a route for where we want to go. And so along those lines, can, for those who aren't familiar, can you describe the two triangles? Yes. So the two triangles are the triangle of conflict. And so again, something I am always talking about is that ISTDP is based on the understanding of unconscious conflicts not just about defense and resistance, not just about feeling, but it's about the fact that certain feelings, wishes, and fantasies have gotten associated with anxiety. And so then they get avoided. Okay, that's the triangle of conflict. Feelings at the bottom, right, which generate anxiety and then drive the need to defend against and try to push out of consciousness those scary, upsetting feelings, okay? So if you think about the triangle of conflict just on its own, it actually doesn't make a lot of sense because our feelings and impulses have been selected for an evolution. They actually have an adaptive value. Why would we get anxious about them? Why would we have to, you know, extrude them from consciousness? So that's where Malin came in and said, we have to add this triangle of person. 
It's in a mo- it's in relationship that we learn about <laughs> feelings. So it's con- emotional conflicts with an origin in the past that because they're unconscious early, right? They just get repeated in the current life. And then often, but not always, that same pattern will get repeated with us. So those are the two triangles, conflict and person. So we might, you call it an interpretation. If I were to say, well, you know, how do you feel towards your brother when he did that? And the person might say, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pissed, I have to say. I, yeah, I'm angry. Well, how do you feel that anger inside? Right, because anger has a signature, right? And the person says, oh God, you know, my stomach hurts. I feel queasy. I'm, I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's not anger, that's anxiety, right? So you see, you're really anxious about your anger, huh? No, we don't know why that is. So I'm not going to interpret that, but... You know, and then do you see that to get away from it, you start laughing, rationalizing, right? So in one way you could say, I'm interpreting, right? That, but really I'm just linking, right? Um, But let's take, for example, I would tend to think of this as an interpretation, which is more about the link between what the person's, playing out currently and something unresolved from the past. So I'm thinking about a man I saw who had, oh golly, you know, migraine headaches, uh, depression, impotence. um, So a host of, um, of symptoms. And so when he came in and I was doing inquiry into, well, when did this depression start, for example, he said, oh gosh, as long, I mean, I had my first suicide attempt, he said at the age of five, I had never heard, he tried to strangle himself, right, on two occasions. Okay, so I'm thinking, wow. So as I'm gathering this data, somehow, his father comes up and his background and his father was a a violent, sadistic man who beat his mother senseless and, you know, really bad. Um, So again, I start to form the hypothesis that he must have a murder because he really loved his mother. His father was an enormous threat He must have wanted to kill his father, right? And both to avoid that, but also maybe punish himself for it. He gets the death sentence, right? He's going to kill himself. So that's my hypothesis. So given that, I'm going to try to see, you know, hey, wow. You know, you remember like watching your father punching your mother. I mean, how do you feel toward him? And he actually was able, you know, to get in touch with this rage. And I said, yeah, and do you see how your, your body is, is getting mobilized? What does your body want to do? And he said, you know, I want to punch him and so on. And I'm like, yeah, what else if it all came out? And he said, well, I, and then he starts to peter out like, well, I, you know, I think that's it. I mean, I, you know, and I said, yeah, but we know, right. So you, that you wanted to kill yourself. So we have to wonder. And before I could even finish, he said, oh, yes, I wanted him dead. I wanted him dead many times. And I was like, wow. So again, multiple factors and multiple, right? So just pressing for feeling didn't get us there. But when I made the link between, wait a minute, your symptom, right? And this, because I think maybe even at the beginning, he said, oh, I could kill the guy. And then he started to take it back. And then I said, yeah, but we know you tried to kill yourself. And then he put it together, right? So again, you want to have, I think, lots of tools in your toolbox and and not just um, do one thing, 
you know, and this is where, again, when you're looking at the best therapists, um, they have these superior metacognitive skills and two of them that stand out are superior working memory, right? So I'm keeping all this data in my head, right? And I do a three hour initial, right? So there's a lot of information, right? But I'm keeping it there, man, you know, so that I can use this later, you know? And then also there is the pattern recognition. And so that's where, again, you might call it an interpretation, right? But you're saying, but there's a pattern here, right? Do you see that, right? It seems like you're always going for unavailable men, you know? And you were saying your dad was, a, you know, whatever. So yeah, I, I use a whole host and see what works. I mean. Something that I often find myself saying to trainees is, even if we think that we're working from a form of therapy that really eschews interpretation, we can't help but be making meaning. Our minds are meaning making machines. We cannot help but be making interpretations and, and like you said, hypotheses in our mind. But what I'm hearing you saying is with this, in this particular example, you didn't directly Pre present him with your interpretation and say, well, I think what's really going on here is right. you are giving yourself the death sentence, right? You, right? you brought him into his experience and got him close to where he could make that connection spontaneously on his own. Am I, am I right that that's- Right. I mean, I think what you're talking about there is, again, I want data. So maybe that's the difference. I'm not just hypothesizing uh, you know, and making a wild interpretation, like probably Melanie Klein would be the example of wild interpretations. I mean, I remember what, you know, the person would say, gee, I'm sorry, I'm late, I got caught in traffic. And she'd say, you know, you want to scoop out my babies and, and suck me dry. And I'm like, what? wait a minute, Where, you know, that's a pretty big leap there. Um, so I want to use data, but I'm using all of it. So I'll use their facial expression, their body language, you know, what they just told me. Um, or they might say, no, no, never. And I might say, well, I think you doth protest too much, right? So that, again, might be called an interpretation. Um, and I'm always very intent to refer it back to what they have already said. So I am not coming across as I am the expert. I understand you better than you do. I can see what you do. No, I'll say now, listen to what you're really saying, right? Because first you said this, then that. So if we add it up together, aren't you really saying, I mean, if you're honest about it, Right, so it's it's really about adding up the data um, and presenting it to them. And again, there's a lot of data on how that really promoting the patient's sense of agency, their mastery, you know, not keeping them in the one down position, you know, that you're the expert and so on, but also really, facilitating that collaborative alliance, working together. But as much as possible, I try to attribute those insights to the patient. Like, I don't think you quite see what you're saying here. Let's, let's put it out in black and white, you know? Yeah. So when you mentioned something about pattern recognition being one of the big meta skills, yes. and and you said I think you said something earlier about um, we, you know about what well, you said about we're coming up with hypotheses. Yeah. Uh, some forms of therapy sort of outline a whole bunch of very common patterns that the therapist can be on the lookout for. Does ISTDP do that, or is it more just person by person, case by case? Like what? Up? What do you mean? Oh. Uh, like schema therapy, for example, might say, well, there's this kind of schema, keep an eye out for that, or that kind of schema, uh -huh. you know, this person might have a victim schema or this person. Uh -huh. um, does ISTDP sort of give, give a bit of a map to the therapist for common patterns to be on the lookout for, or no, it's more well, spontaneous yeah, but, sense? Um, I think, again, it's based on psychoanalytic theory. So 
That's the theory, right, of unconscious conflicts, which in a way we all have. Conflicts around rivalry and competition, jealousy, um, around attachment and loss. Uh, you know, we're all more alike than otherwise, as, as you know, Sullivan would say. Um, having those mixed feelings, wanting to throttle the same person you love. I mean, so understanding these core conflicts that we all struggle with, I think is very important. Um, but as far as it's sort of elucidating what Davin would call the transference pattern of behavior. So we have those core conflicts, which we might, you know, if someone's coming to see us, it's likely it's become a neurotic conflict. Um, but about 80% of our patients in the US, it turns out also have character disorders. So that means they have rigid, habitual ways of being, right? Of we might say really entrenched defenses that they use all the time, whether they're activated or not, right? So they're intellectual and detached or histrionic or paranoid sort of all the time. And again, it is important to be able to gather your data and then have a specific formulation not just that this person seems to have a conflict around anger toward loved ones, right? But they also have a very rigid, um, obsessional uh, character, right? And, and that has to be dealt with first. And so again, I find it alarming actually that to me, this is such basic, information about how human beings operate. And yet so many therapists today don't have this basic knowledge. Uh, you know, I'll say, well, you know, would you say this person is neurotic or character disordered or fragile and disorganized? And, and they might say, oh yeah, I think, you know, character. I, I say, okay, what kind? Well, what do you mean? Well, there's a big difference between a histrionic character and upset. What kind? Are they masochistic? Right? So there's this, um, you know, it's one of the dilemmas because our patients have gotten sicker and sicker over time, right? We have a sick society and people come in with multiple symptoms and character pathology. And yet I think, what is it? 80% now of the therapists have a master's degree. You know, they've had two years, right? And when I started, the huge majority, at least 80% of therapists had a PhD or an MD. They had years and years, right, of study and deeper domain-specific knowledge. Now you have people just wanting to learn technique without having that deep knowledge. And I, I think it just doesn't, you're not going to be consistently effective. If, if that's the case, right, so. Right, so what I'm hearing you saying is that it's, it's, it's really a matter of like having done the, both the educational work and I'm guessing also the personal work to have a sense of what, what are the just core, this, there are a lot of core human challenges and right. needs that we take for granted if we're focused on the surface level of things, but right. that, and to be able to identify all oh, this is a core struggle around this. So that's a core struggle around that guides right. a lot of your. Absolutely. Right. right. And I'm, I'm thinking on these different levels, you know, so let's take, you know, I'm going to be doing a webinar on Monday around understanding conflicts regarding emotional closeness. Right. So we're all wired for attachment. Right, so why would we avoid that, right? Why would we keep people at a distance or even, you know, undermine that, right? Well, you know, 
I mean, the fact is we're going to lose everybody we ever loved, right? That's pretty rough, right? And that's just the way it is. That's what David Schnarch would call loving on life's terms, right? So we all struggle. How do I let myself open up and really attach to somebody knowing that, you know, they might die, I might die, or, um, I, you know, I just heard this uh, song by Billy Joel, and it so spoke to this, where in, in the song, he becomes aware, he said, there's a room in every heart, right, but he had shut it down, and it was under lock and key, you know, and then but he realized this and how he was depriving himself. And I guess he had met someone and he said, I will give you my heart to break. And it's because that's what it is, right? It's a big risk. The right? vulnerability of that. Exactly. We all want the intimacy, but we don't want to be vulnerable. Well, there's a rub, right? So that's a human dilemma. And then you can be on the whole continuum, right? And it can become pathological, right? But also the other um, thing, I don't know if you know Sidney Blatt's, to me, again, classic texts on the polarities of experience, right? So we seem to have two driving forces from birth until death. One is to become a self. And this has gotten neglected with all this focus on attachment, right? From infancy, day one, 70% of the time, the baby is exploring autonomously. Only 30%, you know, gazing at mom. And, you know, so we have these two needs to attach and to be autonomous, to be close and to be separate. And can we get these in balance and working in such a way that actually the more solid I am as a self, the closer I can get, right? But many sacrifice one of these core needs for the other. I have to give up self to be in relationship or the opposite. That's also a very important um, conflict and, and dilemma to become aware of and, and to help people work with so that they can begin to make relationships that are big enough for two people. I mean, so many of our patients, they think it's, yeah, you got to compromise, right? I mean, you know, I'll just give up what I want for her. But then, of course, you're going to resent the hell out of it and she's going to owe you, right? So again, understanding Again, not just what these common, you know, human dilemmas are, but what is what is a healthy resolution to it look like? I mean, that's the other thing that really drew me to Davenlu is, you know, he was a physician and, and psychiatrist, um, but he abandoned the medical model. And just looking at, at things as pathology, right? That we all have the potential to be whole and healthy and to live at whatever our highest capacity is. And I always found that very appealing and I'm kind of allergic to a real pathological view of, of patients. Yeah, so that was another real draw. I can see that, yeah. 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 So uh, I don't know if this is a diverging in a different direction, but I am so curious about the title of your forthcoming book, right, your upcoming book. So uh, Working Through in Psychotherapy, Mastering the Middle Game. The middle game is not a term I'm familiar with, and I'm intensely- Oh, really? Didn't you see The Queen's Gambit? I did not, no. You have to watch it, okay? So it's know. about chess. Yeah. So, okay, you are very well aware of this whole um, push, maybe, or about deliberate practice. Yes. Right, and people wanting to hone their skills. And look, you know, I'm all for it. But again, if that's all you do, and you're not looking at the bigger picture, 
and you don't know why you would be doing something at a particular time, right? So what really is a good analogy for psychotherapy? Um, because deliberate practices, you know, they say, hey, what about sports? What about music? Well, those are not very good analogies because if I'm playing tennis, you know, I have to make that same forehand over and over and over, very consistent, know exactly where it's going to go, right? Same with if I'm in an orchestra, I have to play Beethoven's Ninth the same every time, right? Psychotherapy is improv. <laughs> You never have the same session twice. You have to understand underlying principles. So I think chess is the better analogy. And in chess, like in therapy, we can give you all kinds of good opening moves. Okay, move the rook, say, you know, do your inquiry, right? And then we can also tell you how to wrap it up. You know, okay, they're better than this. Let's do the termination. But how do you get from here to there, right? There are a million, and it all depends, right? So you have to have that bigger view and, and patterns, and you know. Um, and again, those underlying principles and case formulation to guide you because you might be doing a particular intervention perfectly, but it's just not working with this person for whatever reason, right? Like the GPS, right? You're, you're at a stop, the bridge went out, <laughs> okay? Well, you better have your own map so you know what an alternative is. So there are two reasons. So the first, working through in psychotherapy, lots of data, right? The working through phase has the greatest impact on outcome, but is the most neglected not just in research, because again, it's so complicated, but also in training. And so I'm looking and I just couldn't believe it because I, I confronted this all the time with, with my trainees. They got off to a good start and then they floundered, right? And, and they didn't understand the whole process of working through toward resolution. How do you deal with the repetition compulsion, right? How do you facilitate emotional, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I thought, you know, first of all, within ISDP, I thought we really need a book about this. So I start to do my research and look it up. Do you know there's not a single text devoted to this topic? I mean, I put in any, <laughs> right? You might have a chapter, you might have, right? So I thought, first of all, okay, we, we need this. And then again, when I saw that analogy, right? It really is that middle game, uh, that whole mid phase of, of treatment that I think has been neglected and where people really flounder. And yet it's essential, right, to be getting consistent and positive outcome yeah and i can imagine not easy to teach in that middle because there's so much improv in there and right but again i think that's where the deep domain specific knowledge is so important right if you don't have those basic principles uh really solid um then you can lose your way uh and again, there just is no shortcut to mastery. And this is complex. I think that's my first. So the first chapter is working through from the start. So I'm saying that it's not just a phase of therapy, but in a way you're working through hopefully in every session um, and that there's a beginning, a middle and an end, you know? And then the second uh, chapter is complexity and uncertainty. And so I think we as therapists, as well as all other kinds of human beings, we have a tough time dealing with complexity and uncertainty. And then we go, we try to go to sure things, or we try to oversimplify and go to always and never and these sorts of things to deal with our anxiety about the complexity and uncertainty. But it, it doesn't get you there because human beings are very complex, you know? 
Yeah. In fact, there's a great book that I just recommended on my YouTube channel uh, by Adam Grant. Do you know Adam Grant? I don't. Spectacular guy. He's a social psychologist at, at Penn. And he wrote Originals, which was a great book about what is it about these people who are so original, right? And um, so his new one is called Think Again. And it's about the dangers, and this is certainly true for therapists as well as everybody else, the dangers of overconfidence, right? We think we know. And we don't keep that open, curious mind. Maybe that was true in the last three cases, but this is a new person. Let me stay open and curious, right? Um, so we're overconfident. We think I know exactly what's going on here. I know what to do. And then we get confirmation bias too. So if you have a really strong, you know, theory or, you know, that you're, invested in, you're going to make the data fit and get into all this confirmation bias. And so what's the solution? And he said, it's keeping a scientific mind because science were constantly updating. It's just a hypothesis. It's just a theory. Like, did you know that we just got photos and sound from the giant black hole that's in the middle of our Milky Way. Just on third, just yesterday. Wow. Like it's unbelievable, right? So there was this theory and Einstein had this theory of relativity and gravity and stuff, right? But now that we're gonna be able to gather data, they said actually his theory is, is getting confirmed like fabulous it's turning out really well right but but it might not have and we might have had to revise so if you get too attached right um that can really uh well i, I think this touches back into a theme we were talking about earlier that you you have your theory you've got your hypothesis but you're always holding it somewhat loosely always right which is partly why you don't want to be pushing it on the client and getting into a battle for reality with the, exactly. uh, you're always holding that, let's see if what the data that's arising spontaneously and naturally from this experiential in the moment state is actually fitting. Mm -hmm. And maybe not, and maybe this is a difference between ISTD and some others, is I'm not just waiting for things to arise naturally. Um, you know, I am focused, I am intentional. So I, if I have some data, which leads me to believe that this person defends against anger with depression, I'm going to test that out. Now I might be wrong and I might find out, no, it's pathological grief or it's something else. And I'm, I'm happy to adjust. So I, I have a great example and I'm going to be showing this uh, case at a conference in Italy in October where it's around this issue of defenses against closeness. This woman was very prickly, very difficult, and she would argue with everything. And so it's like just trying to get an agreement about the problem and then, no, that's not quite it. And it was always, and, and she was even complaining about my chair. The reason is because the chair uh, wasn't, big enough and she's a big person and how can she, right? So I'm like, ay, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking this woman has a character disorder, right? I'm thinking she does this all the time with everybody. So I started to kind of intervene in that way. And again, she was really pushing back. And I'm thinking that's just her defiant kind of personality, you know? And I was so sort of frustrated at the end of this session, I said to her, because I videotape everything. And I said, listen, I have no interest in arguing with you about this stuff. Why don't you take the tape home and have a look and see, are you then able to see what I'm seeing? So she said, okay. And she comes back in the next session. She says, oh my God, 
you're so right. She said, I'm impossible. And, I'm, and she said, that's so weird because I'm not usually like that. I mean, I have tons of friends. I'm, and I said, oh, really? So it's not always, is it just me? Or are there other people? And she says, oh yes. She said, it's with authority figures. And as far as I'm concerned, you're a card carrying member of that group. So I realized it was transference. It was a specific transference reaction. It wasn't character pathology. So that's a good example where I'll intervene, I'll test it out. But if I get a no, oh, it's something else. Great. Okay, let's pursue that then. Right. So it's it's being able to, yeah, it really is that scientific mind. Gather the data, get a hypothesis, test it out. Yes. And it's the patient's response to intervention that's going to tell you whether you're on track or off track and you need to revise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of that is so alive and in the room yeah. between the two of you. Right. Yes. And I'm very explicit. So that's the other thing that's very different from like ISTDP versus sort of traditional psychodynamic psychoanalytic where the therapist is quite silent. Uh, they're taking in the data, they're making their hypotheses, but they don't really share them directly. Or maybe at the end of the session, I'm constantly feeding back. This is what it looks like to me. Is that right? If, you know, and so I, I'm not holding back on, on my ideas, my, you know, so that's very, and it's also then highly collaborative, you know, which is another really important factor. Yes. So, well, I'm aware that we're going to run out of time soon and I could ask you these questions. I, this is so interesting. We could go on and on, but I do have one last question for you. Okay. So what, what would you say to, I'm sure you come across a lot of people, particularly probably coming from the analytic world who are interested in ISTDP in the same way that Davin Lu at one point was looking for something different. Sure. And, and what, what would you say to people who are coming from the more traditional analytic world about what, should make them, about what? <laughs> well what, what what should make them be looking in this more experiential in the room dynamic yeah, I mean I can just say what happened to me you know and that um, I was always drawn again to the depth and complexity of psychoanalytic theory um, and just like Davos I kind of knew like the, the, there's something that's this real truth here, right? Um, but the methods associated with it over, I think I've been practicing eight years in a traditional manner. And I was really frustrated. And cause I, you know, even though I thought my interpretations were quite brilliant, you know, um, in some cases, they simply bounced off this wall of defense and, and I didn't have the tools, right? And I also remember things like there are, you know how these certain patients and they just stick with you. And I remember one of my first patients when I was a resident, she was uh, in medical school, did not want to be there. She had no interest in being a doctor. She actually wanted to be a baker, but her father, you know, she wanted to please her father. Can you imagine going through medical school? Anyway, she was stuffing all of her feelings quite little, And I was literally watching her blow up. I mean, just like she came into a session. I thought, oh my God, she's gained 25 pounds. And yet I didn't know how to say you know, gee, I'm, I'm noticing, you know, you're really putting on a lot of weight. I wonder what that's about, right? Or, or somebody would be, you know, looking to the floor. I mean, just like I didn't have those effective ways, right, of dealing with the defenses and resistances that really undermine treatment. And so- And they uh, were right there in the room. Exactly. But we didn't- at most, you might be able to, again, make some kind of interpretation about it, right? But um, so I think just 
There is so much. You can keep your same theory. In fact, it's going to be more psychoanalytic than anything you've done before. I mean, I never got the, the kind of depth that I get with the more experiential, right? So it, it always remained a little hypothetical, you know? And it's like, well, is this really happening? You know, because we were just staying on that level. And so, um, yeah, and then also showing tape. I mean, it is so powerful. Um, a number of years ago, I was invited to Harvard Medical School has a psychodynamic, psychoanalytic conference every year. And they invited me to present. And you can imagine, I was very nervous. Um, not only, I mean, Harvard, and then, you know, all these analysts, you know, what are they going to think about this? And of course, I'm the only one showing a tape, everyone else just talks about it, or they read their paper, you know, so I, I had quite a bit of trepidation. And the way they do it is, again, everything's very formal. And they said, Oh, you have to send your uh, paper, your presentation ahead, because you'll have two discussions. And I said, Well, I can't do that. First of all, you know, I'm just going to talk. And then said, Second of all, I'm going to be showing a tape. And they're like, oh, well, what am I going to do? So I said, okay, I can send you the transcript if you want. Okay. Um, so there were two discussants. So I presented. And then the first discussant was referencing Freud and so on. And then the second discussant, discussant was Robert Waldinger who took over for George Valiant, the, the grant project. So pretty, pretty, you know, major guy. So he gets up and he says, my esteemed colleague uh, was referencing Freud uh, when, when looking at this remarkable piece of work here. However, I was reminded of when Harry met Sally and that classic scene where she says, I want what she's having. He said, I want what she's having. That was fabulous. I mean, these people, and then another person that challenged their own group said, all we do is talk about it. We don't show, you know? And I'm like, wow. I mean, I thought now these are actually mature people, right? And they still had an open mind and they did. I thought they would just resist and they didn't at all. So that was really interesting. And I thought Boston of all places would be so, and it really wasn't true at all. They were very open and very interested. And so you never know. But I think showing the work is, uh, you know, because again, it gets people not just uh, in their head, but in their heart as well. And, and the change is unmistakable. It speaks for itself, doesn't it? And people know, oh, there's something going on here. I'm not getting that kind of result every day, you know? Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Well, Patricia, this has been so fun. Thank you so much for joining us. And I, we could talk a lot more. Maybe we'll have an episode number two at some point. Okay. Yeah, I always love talking to you. It was really great. Thanks so much for inviting me. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.